It's a pleasure to introduce um, Brian Ward. Brian is a very bright, uh, very accomplished uh, otolaryngologist uh, from um, Department of Otolaryngology at uh, Johns Hopkins. His forte is very unique and very novel way to modulate vestibular system, which is using a magnet. Um, as you all know, it was also a serendipity, right? I mean, that's how it was, the whole thing was discovered. Um, in the magnet when um, our colleagues were scanning some patients in Italy. Um, uh, without any delay, I want to give the stage over to Brian. It's all yours. Great, well, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, it's great to talk about something that I'm really excited about as well. Um, so um, I'm gonna go through a little bit of that history. Uh, if any of you are familiar with this story about how magnetic fields stimulate the vestibular system, um, and, uh, and it really starts um, back about 30 years ago or so. Um, so for quite some time, decades, people have known, uh, technologists, patients have been reporting um, sensations of dizziness and motion around really high strength MRI machines. So for some context, um, most of the scans that we get clinically are probably one and a half or three Tesla. Um, but uh, around these newer seven Tesla research scans, um, people were often reporting sensations of dizziness. And so um, our group first got involved with this um, with a conversation between David Z and Vincenzo Marcelli. Um, uh, David Z, as many of you know, spent some of his time living in Siena, Italy. Um, and he was talking to uh, Marcelli about a study that he had been working on in one and a half Tesla MRI. So what Marcelli was doing was putting people in an fMRI scanner delivering a caloric stimulus to, to stimulate the vestibular system. Um, and he, um, in a, a publication in 2009, um, made this observation that there was a spontaneous nystagmus that his participants were um, having um, even before injecting water into the ear canal. And Marcelli suspected that this might be due to the magnetic field. So, um, so David Z uh, brought this uh, idea back to, um, to Baltimore uh, and Dale Roberts and uh, Z and Marcelli started putting normal healthy humans into this newly installed seven Tesla MRI that we have at the Kennedy Krieger Institute. Um, and so the question that they were asking was why are people getting dizzy in MRI machines? And really the key to solving this problem is shown in this picture here. So this is a person who's kind of lying outside the MRI scanner um, and they're in darkness and they're wearing these um, infrared video goggles, which uh, you've seen in many of the talks. Um, and the reason this is so important is because a hallmark clinical rule of, a, of vestibular physiology is that a peripheral vestibular nystagmus can be suppressed by visual fixation. So you have to look at the eyes in the dark in order to see what's going on here. Um, this is a video of me. Um, so this is, um, me lying on a uh, table outside of a seven Tesla MRI, slowly going into the scanner. And as I go in, um, you're gonna start to see that I developed a primarily horizontal nystagmus. So my eyes are drifting right and beating left. Um, and I feel like I'm moving. I feel like my, um, my head's going in one direction, my feet are going in the other. Um, but interestingly, the, the sensation goes away relatively quickly within about 90 seconds, but the nystagmus doesn't. It keeps going and going and going. Um, and the best way that I've been able to, um, to, to describe the sensation is as if you're kind of lying on one of these playground um, merry-go-rounds with your, the axis of rotation um, out your navel. So my head is going in one direction, my feet are going in the other, and you feel like you're just spinning in a circle in this way for about 90 seconds. Uh, and then it stops. So um, how do we measure eye movements? Um, I, I know many of you are familiar with this, which is you take a video of the eyes and it's infrared, so the person's in darkness. Um, and then you just threshold that image so that if you look at the spheroid and track this uh, pupil uh, over time, um, you get these characteristic graphs like so. So this is the horizontal eye position over time. Um, so you can see this kind of classic sawtooth pattern of nystagmus um, that has a slow phase, which is the vestibular component, and then this quick phase, which is the resetting. So if you take the slope of the slow phase, that's how fast the eye is moving for that interval of time. And you can plot those, and this is what the graph looks like. So I'm gonna go in, into some detail in this picture here because most of our traces look pretty similar to this. Um, so each of these dots represents the slow phase eye velocity. 
um, to the bottom is to the left and up to, to the right. Um, that's kind of an arbitrary distinction. But you'll see that um, as you enter the magnet, it, it increases to a peak and then over time um, adapts. And then there's this after effect. But what I want to start by drawing your attention to is this green line here. So the reason the green line is important is because the hypothesis that ha people had for why this effect is happening, why people are getting dizzy near MRI machines, is that it required motion near the MRI machine. And so um, you can measure motion by just taking a little loop of wire here, um, which is a search coil. And if you put a magnet through that wire loop, or if you take the loop and run it through a magnetic field, you're gonna generate a current in the wire. So this is something called electromagnetic induction. Um, and that was the, the, the going theory at the time for how people were getting dizzy around MRI machines. Um, and for our purposes, it's a really useful marker for somebody who enters the magnet and then exits the magnetic field. So this is where they enter and there's really no eye movements outside the MRI machine. Um, there's still a fringe field. So there might be one in a seven Tesla or 1.7 Tesla or so outside of a seven Tesla MRI machine. So there still might be a little bit of eye movements, but as they go in, you can see that it increases after a few seconds to a peak velocity. And then it starts to decrease. It adapts, but incompletely. So you can still have nystagmus the whole time, but there's, it's kind of slowly going towards zero. And then once you exit the magnetic field, you get this reversal where the nystagmus goes in the other direction and you actually feel like you're rotating in the other direction too. Um, and this is uh, re reflex adaptation, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So um, one of the first things um, that they did just before I got there was um, putting help, uh, people who have no vestibular function into an MRI machine on either side. And what they found is that those people had no nystagmus in a bunch of different head positions suggesting that this mechanism had something to do with the, the peripheral vestibular labyrinth. So in a series of experiments, um, Dale Roberts, David Z, and colleagues um, sort, sorted all this out. The first is that it's static. So here's an example of somebody being in the MRI, not moving for 25 minutes. Um, and you can see that there's nystagmus the whole time that they're in there. And it persists. So the longest I've been in there has been in an hour and a half, and I've had nystagmus the entire time I was in there. It also scales with magnetic field strength. So in a seven Tesla, it's about twice as strong as a three Tesla scanner. So proportional to the strength of the mag static magnetic field. And if you enter the magnetic field at different rates, you can, you can get stronger induction, but no change in the nystagmus velocity. So that suggests that the, the mechanism is not related to how fast you're moving into or out of the magnetic field. Um, and if you go in for just a short period of time, there's no after effect. I think the most important piece of data um, to, to demonstrate the mechanism was this one. So if you go in the magnetic field head first like this, the magnetic field of an MRI machine is always oriented in the same direction. So it's homogeneous along the length of the bore. Um, sometimes these are polarized from north to south, sometimes south to north. Um, but it's, it's static and it's the same. So if you go in head first, you have nystagmus that beats in one direction. If you go in feet first, it beats in the opposite direction. But what was most important is if they allowed us to actually go into the back of the magnet head first. And if you go into the back of the magnet head first, it reverses direction as well. So why this is important is that it rules out something called magnetic susceptibility. So if you had a piece of iron, that iron would be equally attracted to the north or the south pole of the magnetic field. It doesn't depend on magnetic field polarity. You may have seen some um, funny videos of frogs uh, floating in strong magnetic fields. And the way that works is something called magnetic susceptibility using diamagnetism. So, um, so it, it kind of weakly repels the, 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 um, the cells in the, in the frog and helps support it. So that would be equally repelled by the north or south portion of the magnetic field. And in this mechanism, it's polarity sensitive. It depends on the, on the polarity. The other interesting thing about this is that as you pitch your head in different angles, you can get different velocities of nystagmus. And everybody has this thing called a null position where there's no nystagmus. And if you pitch your head even beyond the null, you can reverse the direction of the nystagmus. So this is, the, this is true for all healthy humans that have been tested so far. They all have this null position here. Each of these lines represents a subject at different head pitch angles. And 
down would be left and up and to the right. And you can see that they're all cross zero at some point. So there's some head pitch angle where no nystagmus exists. Um, but you'll notice that there's a huge variance from person to person as much as 60 degrees. So what's the proposed mechanism? What do we think is going on? It's this thing called static magnetohydrodynamics, um, which is a big fancy word for um, essentially anytime you have current moving through a fluid, you're gonna get, and you put that into a magnetic field, you're gonna get a force in the fluid. So if you think back to physics, if you had a charge and you introduce that charge into a magnetic field, the charge experiences a force. So if you run those charges through a wire and put that into a magnetic field, that wire is gonna experience a force as well called Lorentz force. So the same thing happens if you put those charges through a fluid. So imagine this fluid is kind of like a wire through which current is running. And if you put that into a magnetic field, you get this force called the Lorentz force. Um, and it's represented by this equation here. So the force, the Lorentz force is proportional to how much current you have, the strength of the magnetic field. And then there's this scaling factor H, which is basically how long is your wire? How much distance is that current flowing? And um, the direction is the right hand rule. So you got to stick your thumb in the direction of the current, your index finger in the direction of the magnetic field, and then that cross product, that direction is the, is the direction of the Lorentz force. So important to remember that the force is in the fluid. So here's an example of what that looks like in a dish uh, on a desktop. You have a magnet underneath the table and you have a current going through these two uh, electrodes here and that generates a force in the saltwater bath. And you can see this little bead kind of moving through the fluid here. That's what a Lorentz force is. Um, and that's what we think is happening in the inner ear. Okay, so why, why the inner ear? Well, it turns out the inner ear is kind of an ideal place for all these things to happen. So the reason is um, you have a constant current that is sustaining afferent activity in the vestibular system. So that's part of the vestibular physiology is that it modulates around a resting discharge. So potassium ions are constantly going into the apical ends of hair cells, sustaining that resting discharge. And those potassium ions are created or secreted into the endolymph in, uh, via dark cells. So they circulate through the endolymph and then with relative uniformity will enter into the apical end of utricular hair cells. And so if you put this system into a magnetic field, you'll get a cross product between the direction of the magnetic field and the utricular current that creates a force and can displace the cupula of the semicircular canal. And that would give you an nystagmus. So here, endolymph serves two purposes, which is it transmits both current and force. And those are the two things you need in order to generate a Lorentz force. So let's look a little closer at the anatomy. So this is a, um, a really nice um, uh, freely downloadable software from Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. Um, the link is here. Um, this, this is a reconstruction of histopathology. And so this is the cochlea. Here's the utricle. There's the superior canal and the lateral canal. And we're gonna take a look from the inside. And here you can see this is the utricular macula, lateral canal crista, superior canal crista. And so if you had utricular current that was constantly going into the utricular macula here, and you introduce that into a magnetic field, as long as there's a difference between the vector for the magnetic field and the utricular current, you're gonna generate a force in the endolymph, which can displace fluid and, um, and stimulate the lateral canal and the superior canal. So you imagine the same thing happening on both sides. You'll get your Lorentz force and it generates fluid movement, which stimulates the lateral semicircular canals in the same direction as a head rotation and opposite directions for the superior canals. So the net effect of this is that there would be a horizontal component that would be dominant. The vertical components would cancel. But interestingly, we didn't appreciate this at first, the torsion should actually sum. And so we went back um, and started, we had a developed, got better cameras and we had um, Jorge Otero Milan's beautiful torsional uh, analysis. And you can see, if you look at this eye, it's almost like it's swinging on a pendulum. So this is a mix of horizontal and torsional nystagmus, but it's actually the opposite of what you would see if you had a unilateral vestibular hypofunction where the eye would ordinarily be kind of rolling like a wheel. In this case, it's more swinging, almost like it's a, like a, like a pendulum. So this is kind of the updated model of what we think is going on, um, where you have the utricular current from the two ears, you have the magnetic field vector, 
And whenever there's a difference between these two vectors, you're going to get that cross product. And it's going to cause a Lorentz force that displaces the cupola of those two semicircular canals. When those two vectors align, when the utricular vector, net utricular current, and the um, magnetic field vectors align, there'll be no cross product and there's no nystagmus. So that accounts for the null position. And then if you pitch your head forward beyond the null, then based on that right-hand rule, the vectors are gonna change the other way and you'll get nystagmus in the opposite direction. So that's why the polarity is important for this mechanism. So we looked at subjects who had unilateral vestibular hypofunction. Um, and as, as expected, the, the, there's a difference in the vertical components. So they actually had vertical, which we didn't see in the normals. And the right side tended to get a slow phase up and the left side tended to get a slow phase down. And if you go back to that model here, you can see why. The horizontal components are in the same direction, but remember the vertical components are in the opposite direction. So there's a difference depending on whether you have a functioning right superior canal or a functioning left superior canal. So we're not alone. Others have looked at this as well. Um, there's, there was a group, I think, um, unfortunately they're kind of spread to different institutions now, um, but when they were together, um, had been doing some really great work on, um, on, on, on this um, finding as well using seven Tesla MRI. Um, they created this beautiful finite element model that shows that the forces are sufficient to displace the cupola of the semicircular canals based on the amount of utricular current. So um, one other interesting thing that, um, about this mechanism is that it produces a force that's like a constant acceleration, which is something that's really difficult to do in any other circumstance. Um, and to do that, you have to displace the cupola and keep it displaced the entire time. And that's what generates a persistent horizontal nystagmus. So when a person enters the MRI here, there's this adaptation component and then the after effect or the reversal phase, which reflects how much adaptation has happened in the MRI machine. So when I was in the MRI for 90 minutes, my reversal phase lasted about 40 minutes um, after I came out of the MRI. And it's proportional to the amount of time you've been in there. Um, but keep in mind, there's a big dissociation between the nystagmus, which endures, and the perception of rotation, which is uh, only goes away or only lasts about one or two minutes. So um, we did some studies in uh, comparing constant chair acceleration to this magnetic vestibular stimulation. Um, and Prem, Jerry, and Sedison uh, did this work and found that it's pretty similar to a constant acceleration in the chair when you go from subject to subject and um, account for the differences in the stimuli. Um, and also similar to what um, Malcolm and Melville Jones had shown as well. Um, one of the common questions I got pretty early was, well, what are the effects of vision? So we haven't seen this is, is often what people will say. Um, and that's, I think in part because most of the time people are fixating when they're in an MRI machine, they're not really looking at the eyes in darkness. Um, and so the question is, well, if you just have people fixate, does, does it make it go away? Um, so we did a series of experiments where we took the same subjects and put them outside, inside and outside the magnet. And in one situation, we had lights off. And in the other, we turned the lights on shortly after entering the MRI and shortly, um, uh, and then turned them off again shortly before exiting. So outside the MRI, this is one subject here, um, no nystagmus. And then they go in the MRI, their nystagmus um, increases to a peak. And then you turn the lights on. And um, as you'd expect, you can suppress the nystagmus. But if you turn them off again, at some point just before exiting, the nystagmus level increases to approximately what it would be as if you had been in darkness the whole time. And then if you follow what happens after they come out, the after effects, this af um, reversal is essentially the same. So the interpretation is that adaptation is occurring independent of whether your eyes are open or closed or fixating. Um, and it, it's therefore at a level that's probably in the vestibular nucleus, even before fixation mechanisms, act to suppress nystagmus. So why this matters is, you know, we know for, um, that vision and retinal slip is critical for adaptation for dynamic vestibular function. Um, but it turns out for static adaptation that this is probably happening no matter what your eyes, uh, whether you're fixating or not. It's also not just in humans. So um, this, um, so ever since, you know, uh, 2010, people uh, at the Magnet Lab, the Mag Lab in Florida State University, this is Charles and Thomas Helped, 
um, they started putting rats and mice into really strong MRI machines, 14 Tesla, and seeing kind of what their behavior was like. And they would find that they would walk in circles. And then if you put them in water, they'd swim in circles after putting them in the magnetic field. Um, and if they did a chemical labyrinthectomy, you could ablate this behavior. So very similar to, to what's happening in the humans too. And, and the data um, was consistent. So we looked at nystagmus in mice. Um, so here's a C57 um, black six mouse with a horizontal nystagmus in a, in a 4.7 Tesla MRI. So going in nose first. Um, and a couple of things are different. One is the speed is much faster. The nystagmus is much quicker. And it also sort of tapers off over about a minute or so. And, um, and that may reflect the vestibular physiology of the mouse. Um, but the directions were similar. So if they went in nose first, it beat in one direction and the tail first, it beat in the other direction um, and uh, was consistent with this Lorentz force. Uh, one of the questions we had for you know, developing a mouse model is, well, is the utricle important? And is there a way of testing that hypothesis? So the best model we came up with was a head tilt mice. These are NADPH deoxidase uh, deficient mice that are born without otoconia. So they have functioning hair cells. Um, the afferents are uh, also functioning. They have ribbon synapses, but they have no otoconia. And so they have a head tilt, which is uh, why they're called that. And if you put them in water, then they can't orient themselves um, because they have no gravity receptor. Um, so we did a bunch of, um, I'm not sure in that data, but ocular counter roll testing on them and they have no ocular counter roll. But if you do VOR testing on them, they do have a VOR. So here's kind of some sinusoid um, horizontal VOR um, showing the gain of these mice. The gain is less in the NOx3 mice than in the C57s, but they do have a VOR. And we put these mice into the MRI machine. We had eight of them um, that were genetically supported and none of them had nystagmus in any orientation that I could, I could assess. So it suggests that the utricle is important. You need a functioning utricle in order to develop for this mechanism to work. Another idea we had was, um, <laughs> was, was using um, zebrafish, which are kind of a hot uh, model for high throughput screening. Uh, there really isn't a high throughput screen for vestibular function. And so this is a zebrafish that's about to go, here we go, into an 11.7 Tesla MRI machine. Um, and about two thirds of the adult zebrafish had the similar kind of rolling, flipping and tumbling behavior the entire time they were in the magnetic field. Um, and you can kind of quantify that here by tracking their swim path and assessing how fast they were moving. Um, and you'll see in a second that, um, that the fish are okay. <laughs> I just need to prove that to you, there they are. <laughs> So why does this matter? Um, I wanna take this a little bit back to inner ear imaging and kind of what, um, and why I think this is important. So what's the state of the art in inner ear imaging? So on this left panel here, we have um, a flat panel CT scan of the temporal bone. Um, and these um, uh, produce really beautiful high resolution images of the bony anatomy of the inner ear. So we routinely use um, scans like this to look for things like superior canal to Hisson syndrome, um, we've picked out malleous uh, neck fractures with this. You can consistently see the stapes. So, um, so these are really nice images, but you can see that you can't really see inside the, um, the soft tissue structures of the inner ear very well. So for doing that, the best we have is MRI. And this is a three Tesla um, uh, heavily T2-weighted KISS sequence. Um, it's probably the best for looking at some of the anatomy of the inner ear. Um, but you can see that it's a little crude. Um, you can see the nerves here, but there's also these problems of things like banding artifacts, which um, probably don't reflect actual anatomic issues inside the inner ear. So we need to do better. Um, one of the coolest, I think, developments in the last decade or so has been um, using gadolinium-based contrast agents to enhance the inner ear and see distinctions between the perilymph and the endolymph. Um, and how that works is that gadolinium um, can cross the blood labyrinth barrier and it preferentially is taken up into the perilymph. It doesn't seem to get into the endolymph in normal circumstances. Um, and so if you give a bolus of IV gadolinium and you wait four hours and then scan somebody in one of these three Tesla MRI machines, you can see that the bright of the perilymph contrasts with the dark of the endolymph. And you can create special pulse sequences to take advantage of this. Um, and quantify the amount of space um, of the endolymphatic uh, compared to the perilymphatic space. So um, a lot of labs are using this to identify patients with endolymphatic high drops. 
Um, and, uh, and it's really useful for research studies, I think, right now. And, uh, and they're starting to expand to kind of more potential diseases of the inner ear. High field MRI is inevitable. And the reason is a fundamental pr uh, principle of physics, which is that the amount of signal is available is dependent on the strength of the magnetic field. So currently there's about 75 high field MRI machines in the world. Um, Siemens in the United States ha, um, at least has been approved by the FDA, FDA to market their seven Tesla machine for clinical use. It's currently being used mostly for MS and for um, some knee procedures, um, but it's, it's inevitable it's coming. And the other thing to keep in mind is that our Lorentz force hypothesis is proportional to the strength of the magnetic field here. So in a seven Tesla scanner, you're gonna have twice as much uh, stimulus as a three Tesla. So we had a, um, one patient who underwent a surgery for this pituitary tumor. And uh, about three days after her surgery, she underwent a three Tesla scan. And she felt fine going into the scanner, but as soon as she came out, she felt vertigo and she vomited in the MRI suite and developed a CSF leak. Um, so she ended up getting a lumbar drain and the CSF leak resolved. Um, but we had her come back for her follow-up scan and that same scanner six months later, and we found that as she came, didn't really have much nystagmus in the scanner, but afterwards she had an after effect where she felt like she was moving the other direction. She didn't vomit this time, but it just kind of supports the, the principle that there might be vulnerable people for whom this, this really does make a difference. Um, and it's inevitably gonna become more prevalent when we get to seven Tesla clinical scanners. Our field is full of what I would call invisible diagnoses, things that are inferential that are based on eye movements, um, but we can't really see right now. So some of these include congenital absence of otoconia, heavy cupula, light cupula, canal jam, and then vestibular atelectasis here. So many of these things we should be able to see if only we could get better MRI technology. And so I anticipate MRI is going to become more of a, um, a focus in the future. Um, there are some interesting surprises that people have found during surgery. So here's a posterior canal plug patient with debris in the posterior semicircular canal, um, which was uh, beautifully uh, rendered in this, uh, this publication by Cal et al. Um, there's a, a case report. This is a patient who had refractory positional vertigo, apogeotropic horizontal nystagmus, eventually underwent a labyrinthectomy, um, and the... Uh, the surgeon was surprised to find that um, when they were kind of exploring the ampulla, they actually found, uh, I'll just skip ahead here a little bit, a ball of granulation tissue, which was sitting in the ampulla of the horizontal semicircular canal. So just a, an example of something like this that should be visible on MRI, if only it can improve its resolution. Um, there's a, a, this is a, a paper in guinea pigs um, from 2017 with long duration scanner um, delivering what is essentially a histological uh, uh, level resolution. And then this is work from our lab um, where you can see these are 17 hour scans. So unreasonable to do in a human, but utricular macula, the crista of the canals, the posterior cupula. Um, so that's what we're aiming for and hope to go in the next decade or so. So I wanna thank um, uh, funders who have funded um, much of this work over the last 10 years from the NIH, the American Neurological Society. Um, and of course, uh, just a terrific team of mentors, Dale Roberts, David Z, John Kerry, Charlie Dillis and Tina, um, and, and my team of collaborators, um, as well as the Kennedy Krieger Institute, which supports the scans. So um, happy to take questions. Thank you so much for your time and for the opportunity. So I, don't have any questions in the chat box. Anybody from the panel has any question? Jorge, I see you. Yes, that, that was outstanding, Brian. Thank you. Um, have you done acute cases? Uh, that is an acute vestibular neuritis. Uh, in that case, the utricle force will not be functioning theoretically. And, and what will happen? I, I, what, what I've seen, uh, well, well, also if you begin doing the scan, does the mag, because you're interrupting the scan as it goes with the radio waves to get the scan, will then feel uh, not work? Yeah, great questions. Um, so we haven't yet looked at acute vestibular patients. Um, we are starting to look at patients with Meniere's disease, um, recently have approval to do that. Um, so not sure about um, kind of what acute vertigo would do to, or, or whether you could mitigate that. Um, in terms of the scan, we have um, recorded eye movements in some people who've undergone MRI, it hasn't changed. 
um, the strength of the magnetic field is, um, is, is really strong relative to the amount of gradient um, that, that goes into the scans when the, the imaging is being done. So, um, so I, I think it's, it's unlikely to make a huge difference, um, at least at the level of the ears. But. Because what, what we see is the, the eyes deviate to the slow phase consistently. Uh, if you have an acute peripheral nystagmus or, or even central, uh, somehow the fast phase is, is gone, possibly because it's fixation loss, and then you just have a, a, a slow phase. But I, we never done that. In, I mean, only three Tesla. I, I never done any more than that. <laughs> Be interesting to see what happens. Yeah. Thank you. So I. I have actually interesting story to share. So, and I have a question for you also, Brian. So the story is this was around the time when Dave Z uh, had that paper, I think in current biology, that was the first big paper, right? Uh, when I was PGY2 resident, uh, I was a frontliner for stroke, right? I mean, anybody who was in the hospital, I would be the first one to see them. And of course we get the MRI most of the times right away. So the guy comes in with acute vestibular syndrome central and had a, had a stroke, a nodulus, I believe. Um, goes into, this is like a regular, I think three Tesla scanner, uh, regular clinical MRI for stroke. And he goes in and then he comes out that his nystagmus was gone. So I just have a, I mean, you know, I, there is no science beh behind this. I, I just speculate that this is probably something happened <laughs> that reset his central nystagmus. Uh, can, it, can it be possible? I told that to my team next day and they were all laughing at me, but I, I'm still a believer that this is still possible. Yeah, but maybe. So maybe it kind of counteracted it if it was in the opposite direction. Um, uh, was it an, an enduring effect or was it just kind of a, a brief? No, actually, it got he 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 felt much better. I mean, he had a reset. Nice. Generally, it takes them about twenty four to 60, uh, 48 hours to and they gradually get better, right? So this guy, he goes in and I saw him. I know I saw him, and he had robust nystagmus. He was throwing up, and now he comes out much better. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and he did not have BPPV. We did not do anything with positioning head or whatever, but he did have a stroke, I know that. So that's, where do we stand? The question is, where do we stand on portable magnets, which you can eventually use for rehab? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I mean, you need a high magnetic field strength. You need at least five Tesla um, to, yeah. to, I think, generate a strong enough response. Um, to be meaningful physiologically. And so to do that, it, it, wouldn't, it couldn't be portable, I would say. Um, we, we worked with Oxford Instruments to de design a magnetic stimulator, um, but it turns out it, it's about $6 million to build. It's not, <laughs> it takes a lot of space. Um, so um, I, I, think, I think we need some technologically imp improvements to make it portable. Can I do that? Sure, yeah, I'm fine. I just missed one question. Uh, I don't think it is related to magnetic, but do you think radiation from cell phones can contribute to dizziness? Oh, great question. I, uh, <laughs> I don't think I, have, I don't think I don't think there's any evidence to support that. I think people have looked into it for um, vestibular schwannomas, but um, it's kind of weak, pretty weak epidemiologic data. Um, so not, no mechanism that I can I can support right now. Probably, if it was, then we would all be walking like zombie. <laughs> it's been around for a while. Anyways, um, okay.